So in our last PowerPoint, uh, we focus on red blood cells and we learn a couple of key components or a few key components about red blood cells. We learn about their size, about 7.5 micrometer. And this is essential because basically um, they are uh, small enough to pass through the capillary network of your body one at a time. We learn that males typically have a higher concentration of red blood cells because they have a larger muscle mass. Uh, we learn that, that red blood cells do not carry any organelles or nuclei. And as a result, they cannot fix or repair themselves. And consequently, they can live only between 100 to 120 days. Uh, they carry a protein called hemoglobin, uh, which is responsible for uh, primarily uh, carrying oxygen. And it also has a function in carrying carbon dioxide at very low concentrations. And it originates from uh, red bone marrow, which is uh, present inside the spongy bone. Now, something that I do want to go over is the shape of your uh, red blood cells, uh, which is in reality considered to be biconcave, which is um, similar to having a donut, uh, but the hole at the middle of the donut is not complete. Now, why is this important? Why is this biconcave shape important? Because it actually expands the surface area by about 30%. Now, why is surface area important for us? Because when we have an increase in surface area, or we just have a large surface area, that actually improves chances of processes such as diffusion, processes such as absorption, and again, um, processes such as secretion. So uh, the way I describe it is think about you have one small gate, a small surface area. Not that many molecules can get in and out. But as you increase the surface area, as you increase the gate size, a number of gates, then um, you will have the ability to move larger number of molecules. Um, here is basically a typical picture of the red blood cells that you will see under the, your light microscopes. Um, these, each of these cells are representing one tiny red blood cell. And again, kind of wrap your head around it, that in one cubic millimeter, which is a really small volume, uh, you have about 5.2 to 5.8 million cells uh, within that tiny space. So these red blood cells are really small. Now, looking at the red blood cells, we can, and if you can actually take one of these red blood cells you see here, let's say you take one of these tiny dots, and you burst these cells open, what you will find inside of them is that 95% of the total, um, um, total mass of your hemo uh, sorry, total mass of your red blood cells would be hemoglobin, the protein that we are discussing. So what is hemoglobin? What does it do? What does this shape look like? So let's go ahead and do a very simple drawing of these um, hemoglobin proteins, and then we give you some numbers to kind of familiarize you with um, the idea of um, oxygen and carbon dioxide movement. So what we have, the main uh, scaffolding of your um, hemoglobin are these four components which are referred to as globin, hence the word hemoglobin, globin, subunits, which are basically proteins or um, chains of amino acid that has been folded. As you can see, there are four of them. So two of these units are identified as alpha globin, and two are identified as beta globin. Now, in, if you look at the picture on top, you can kind of see these. You have one, you have two, you have three, and you have four of these globin units, basically what I draw on the bottom. At the center of each of these, you have a, a circle, and these circles that I'm drawing inside represents the uh, heme components, which is what you see as red circle here. So I can draw a line going from this and write heme, 
And heme is important because it is basically the red pigment, what gives the hemoglobin and red blood cells its red color. So what you see and what you consider as red is basically the heme component of your uh, hemoglobin. At the center of each of these heme, you have an iron atom, which we shorthand to or use the atomic um, uh, shorthand for it, or sorry, I should say, um, sh um, chemical shorthand for it, uh, which is Fe. And what is the function of Fe? Is to carry, well, Fe again is iron, is to carry the oxygen molecule. So if you notice within one hemoglobin, I will have four iron, and each of these irons can bind to one oxygen. On the other hand, if I go back to the globin subunit, which is two alphas and two betas, the function that is associated with that is carrying CO2, carbon dioxide. So if I say which components of hemoglobin is responsible for carrying CO2, your answer should be globin, and which components is responsible for carrying oxygen, your answer should be the iron that is found at the center of your hemoglobin. Now, if you take a look at the numbers of um, your um, uh, globin as well as hemoglobin within an individual red, um, individual red blood cells, these are the numbers we get. If we start with one hemoglobin, Inside this hemoglobin, you have four oxygen molecule, and inside one red blood cell, you have 250 million hemoglobin. So, if one of these hemoglobin of the 250 carries four oxygen, I said one, in one red blood cell, I will carry, what, 250 times 4, which becomes 1 billion oxygen molecule per red blood cell. One tiny red blood cell, the circles that I showed you previously, each of these circles, if they are fully saturated with oxygen, each of them have the ability to carry one billion oxygen molecule at a given time. And that's a significant number um, if you just think about that in one cubic millimeters, you have about millions, let me just not, not name the numbers again or read the numbers again, but within one cubic millimeter, you have millions of red blood cells, and each of those tiny red blood cells are carrying one billion uh, oxygen molecule at a given time. Now, we also talked about um, earlier, um, uh, in the last PowerPoint, we mentioned that um, red blood cells do live a short life, about 100 to 120 days, because of absence of nucleus and organelles, and inability to fix or repair themselves. So, if you think about red blood cells, as I mentioned earlier, majority of the red blood cells would be made up of hemoglobin, about 95%. So, if I destroy red blood cells, what I'm actually destroying is hemoglobins. So, let's take a look at the components of hemoglobin, and based on that, identify what happens to each of them. So, the first one we start with is, let's just start with globin, actually. Globin is the proteins. If you guys remember, proteins are made up of amino acids. So, when I take out globin and I start to break it down, what I break it down to is amino acid. Now, if you eat protein, you don't want to remove it as soon as you break down something, right? You want to reuse them, you want to recycle them. So, this globin subunit can be reused for protein synthesis again. So, the example I give my students is this. You have a building made up of Lego, okay? Globin. What you do is, if you get tired of that building, or the building, let's say, a piece of the building falls off because the Lego pieces fall off, you don't throw all of your Lego pieces away. What do you do? You break it down to individual Lego pieces, and then use them to build a new building or new structure. So that's exactly what your body does. 
Now, it could be only for production of protein synthesis in the sense of producing new globin proteins, or it could be used to produce other type of proteins that are not globin. Iron and heme are the other components we need to talk about. So heme is the color component. When it gets degraded, it becomes bilirubin. Bilirubin gets transported to your liver, and liver transports this to the digestive system as part of the fluid that gets released called bile. Bile eventually works its way to the uh, large intestine, become part of the fecal matter, and give the fecal matter its color. So again, if you want to identify some sort of disease, there are diseases that prevent the destruction of red blood cells properly, so your body will retain bilirubin, and the color of the fecal matter starts to basically be removed, uh, so you don't typically see the darker color. Um, again, the, the fecal matter becomes very light. Uh, we'll talk about another thing about your heme and removal of heme. You can also remove bilirubin in, uh, through the urinary system and basically excretion as part of, the, um, as part of urine. Last components we have is iron. Iron is extremely important for your body. If you ever had anemia, one of the most common type of anemia is deficiency in iron, or basically iron deficiency anemia. Uh, so when your hemoglobins are being broken down, you can take that extra iron and reuse it, either store it in liver for later reuse, or I can send that um, iron to red bone marrow. And uh, if you guys remember, red bone marrow was production of red blood cell. So, wow, sorry. Production of red blood cells. So basically, I am also recycling the iron, very similar to what I've done for globin. Here's a picture that highlights what I'm describing for you um, to just kind of go over it. On the top part, what you have here is this structure as a whole represents a macrophage. Macrophage is a type of white blood cell that carry a process called phagocytosis, which basically they eat up things. Um, you can see uh, that they either eating damaged or broken apart red blood cells or a full red blood cells that is about 120 days. They are basically um, dissolving or degrading that component. Notice that it says that is broken down to amino acid, which is sent to bone marrow for RBC formation. You have iron coming off, Fe, uh, which is also being transported to red bone marrow for production of red blood cells. And here um, you have the heme component that has eventually becomes bilirubin, gets transported to your liver, excreted as bile into the large intestine, and eventually eliminated as fecal matter. And here you also have bilirubin getting transported to your kidneys and eliminated as urine. So depending on which components, every part can go in different locations and um, either recycled or removed from your system completely. Now moving on to uh, finishing up with red blood cells and moving on to um, white blood cells or rucocytes. Um, if you guys recall, um, when we spin the sample and we centrifuge the sample, we created three layers. Um, we had on top, we had plasma. Uh, on the bottom, we had your red blood cells. And in the middle, we had a layer uh, called the buffy coat, right? And that is basically carries leukocytes and platelets inside. Now, platelets, as you can see, it's still there. We're not really changing anything. But what you think, you, you, one thing that you do need to notice is that if you're looking at white blood cells or leukocytes, there are different types of white blood cells. They are identified as neutrophils, eosinophils, 
basophils, lymphocytes, and monocytes. And a couple of words should pop out to you guys as you can see the breakdown for them. The word granulocytes, wow, sorry, I'm supposed to be circle, granulocytes versus agranulocytes. So what is the difference between these two? So let me go a couple of slides. So down here, it describes what is granulocytes versus agranulocytes. Granulocytes are the ones that carry granular structures inside. So if I take a cell, what I would see is a bunch of dots that represents granules, which is basically vesicles. If you do have very visible granulars inside the cells, we refer to those as granulocytes. And if those um, granules are not visible to us or our absence are considered to be a granular leukocytes. Now looking at white blood cells in general, um, we already know their function is to protect body from infection of microorganisms. And um, they also um, function outside the bloodstream in loose connective tissue. And they're also kind of part of the lymphatic system, if you guys recall. Now, if you ever wonder and you're looking at uh, the PowerPoint, you said, what is this? This represents a shorthand or uh, a way to remember the frequency of the white blood cells based on the sentence. So, look at the capitalized letter. N stands for neutrophils, L stands for lymphocytes, M stands for monocytes, E stands for eosinophils, and B stands for basophils. So never let it monkey eat banana basically is a way for you guys to remember the frequency of your white blood cells. Here is a representation of the uh, five categories of your white blood cells. Neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, monocytes and lymphocytes and I do want you guys to notice that the pictures on top you can see very clear distinction of the spots throughout so neutrophils has a kind of a mixed color of pink and purple eosinophils looks very red and basophils is look very purple um, these ones, um, this is not the best picture, I don't know why the textbook used it actually, um, but you basically won't see as much um, in the uh, cytoplasm, and this one is mostly actually just a nucleus, you don't see much cytoplasm to start with. So in the next PowerPoint, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about um, the categories of leukocytes, and uh, what are the functions associated with each, and then lastly, uh, finish up the PowerPoint by, by going over uh, the platelets and their functionality in blood clotting. Thank you.